yes, generally. Well, I can't ask to anybody in particular that, you know, I don't look at Murdoch, but Fairfax reporting on the skirt of poisoning and Syria. Oh, yeah, you go. Hello? So the, the Fairfax reporting on the scurple poisoning in Syria has been abominable. Now, uh, indeed, you know, that entire world section is a disgrace. Uh, you know, here is a media outlet that uh, has been concerned with uh, the deterioration of its profits from the print media. Uh, uh, it, Elsewhere in the paper, they're, they're doing investigative reporting on Australian issues. Uh, where is the rationale? Oh, this may be a naive question, but what is the rationale for Fairfax to be reproducing the New York Times, the Daily Telegraph, that talks complete shit on a daily basis? Uh, uh, Where's the rationale for a so-called profit-oriented uh, company to be uh, uh, lying on a, on, a, on a regular basis? It's a, it's a great moral story, isn't it? People can get involved in rescuing a people from their, their evil dictator. It's like a cartoon or something that they can step into. Maybe the Hollywoodization of, of war is, is the theme that Tiana can develop more. Um, but uh, I stopped reading the Fairfax News in March 2003, because they gave a bit of coverage to the, the anti-war movement before that, and then when the Australian troops went in, John Howard said, get behind our troops, they had a front page story with Australian soldiers giving sweets to some Iraqi children, I thought, that's the end, that's the end uh, for me. Um, I mean, in this country, the I guess the Fairfax media has had a little bit of a smaller liberal image, even though apparently they consistently supported conservative governments for more than 150 years. But nevertheless, the issues like refugees and some other social issues, they were seen as more, more liberal on. In my view, this particular war, or the, the Libyan one, the Syrian one, unlike the Iraqi one, which was a realist war, or, or some of the analysts in the USA, the Republicans are realists because they, they say, we're going to do what's in our interest. And the liberals say, we're on a mission. We're on a mission to save people and have a civilising influence in the world. What they call it smart power these days with Hillary and Obama and so on. And so, in my view, this sort of war against Syria and against Libya based on these constant emotional stories is much more appealing to the Western liberal mind, I would say, the Western colonial liberal mind, uh, than the realists. The realists often have doubts. You see now, the right-wing media in the US sometimes says, but we're fighting Al-Qaeda, aren't we? You know, if we're not fighting Al-Qaeda, if Assad's fighting Al-Qaeda, we should be with Assad. So you see they have a, they have a dilemma. They, they want to support their country, but then they also believe their own foundational myths in a way. Um, so to my mind, the Sydney Morning Herald has, has, has it with the image of a smaller liberal uh, outlet or, you know, having, uh, you know, social sort of bleeding heart stories often in the mix there, in the mix of other things, while they support the privatisations and all the rest of it, um, it appeals to them. It's like a, it's a humanitarian uh, mission. And if we look at 19th century liberalism, uh, like John Stuart Mill, for example, in England, they wrote in the same sort of way. In fact, a lot of US liberals draw on, precisely on John Stuart Mill, who believed in the colonial era, who didn't believe in the independence of colonised peoples. I say this um, you know, with, a, with a, a, a relevance here because, of course, it's no accident that Britain and France are the two supporting the US in these attacks on Syria, and they are precisely the colonial powers uh, in, in living memory. Um, but that's, that's my view of it, that there is a humanitarian mission that appeals even more to the UK Guardian, the New York Times, the, 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 the Amnesty International once it's been captured by the US Department of State than the realist think tanks who think, you know, we want something, we'll take it. They're much more upfront about it. That's my view. Any other questions? I guess, like, I had a, I had a point that I wanted to make. Um, it's, it goes to the chemical weapons talk that uh, Tiana raised, and 
Um, first, I wanted to kind of draw on Chomsky. I don't particularly like Chomsky these days because of his views on Syria and his unwillingness to take a position. Um, and generally, I don't like a lot of the stances that he's taken. But I remember he was talking about the Vietnam War, and he said that um, the, the strategy of the media back then was to try and limit the range of discourse to only have on the one extreme, can we win the war or can we not? And that's what the, the debate was about. I think the chemical weapons uh, um, story with Syria is very similar, in the sense that we are being asked to, ask the, uh, to, to answer the question, did Syria do it or did Syria not do it? But I think the broader picture is to acknowledge that all of this controversy has effectively stripped an Arab state of its strategic deterrent against a country like Israel, which possesses not only chemical weapons, but nuclear weapons, which are far deadlier. And so maybe Tiana would like to comment further, or... Anyone? I have a question, I have a question for Shamik. Uh, I just want to know whether you've studied, uh, Shamik's doing a PhD in this territory, whether you've studied the Israeli media and if you could give us some insight into the difference between the Israeli media on Palestine and the Australian media. Thank you. Uh, according to my experience, the media, Western media are similar, uh, regardless in Australia or in, uh, in Europe, or also about Al Jazeera and also Arab uh, media like Al Jazeera and Arabia, all of them like uh, all the time wanted to uh, talk about the situation in Palestine in um, focusing about war journalism, like uh, focusing on uh, the elite voices and justification of uh, crimes against humanity. Look at the situation now in Gaza. And uh, despite the peaceful rallies in Gaza, the Western media trying to say Israeli soldiers shoot Hamas leaders, and that's not true. Because all the situation and all the evidence prove the rallies in Palestine and Gaza, especially in Gaza, are peaceful rallies. But Unfortunately, the media are trying to repeat the allegations of Israeli leaders for their crimes against uh, civilians. Also, when they are talking of resistance, they are trying to describe resistance as a terrorist action. Despite resistance is uh, legal because uh, when any country like uh, subjected to any occupation, it is normal to people to resist this occupation. And uh, I know and I realize the importance to all the time just to target the soldiers to avoid civilians of the world. And, and our resistance in Palestine, all the time focusing to resist against Israeli soldiers. If you have idea what happened in Gaza, the, the Palestinian resistance can be able to shoot the soldiers. Many images about that, but despite of that, they didn't shoot the soldiers. They wanted to send a strong message for all the world that Palestinians are struggling against occupation, not against the Jewish people, because the Israeli Zionist lobby trying to to portray the conflict in Palestine as against Jewish people. And that is not true, because all the Palestinian factions are in agreement that our struggle against occupation, not against Jewish people. And we have a lot of uh, supporters and friends from Jewish community around the world. So for us, as a person, it is important to activate non-violent resistance in order to refute the allegations of Israel. Now, if you uh, like uh, have idea about the Israeli government are afraid of this resistance because they wanted to justify the crimes. But now it's not easy for them because everything is clear in Gaza. 
and they are afraid to have like strong and like uh, spring up uh, spring rallies which I am talking about what happened in Egypt and in Syria because uh, on 14th of May will be the biggest rally maybe in Gaza and maybe around 1 million so the situation will be so hard the situation will be uh, difficult and all the media now in Gaza waiting for this uh, big rally and yesterday Israeli for example uh, shot the civilians around uh, 700 were injured most of or all of them civilians and four Palestinians were killed and um, I don't know what is the situation will be uh, in Gaza so for us as Palestinians it is important to cooperate with journalists in order to to be able to uncover uh, the truth about the situation in Palestine. Now, Palestinian factions in agreement to activate nonviolent resistance, and I think this is good. Oh, and we should have like uh, coordination with international media and local media. Also, we have a problem about some activists when they um, publish some posts. This can be exploited by uh, Zionist lobby. They wanted to say, look at the Palestinians. They target, for example, civilians. And that is not true. Palestinians just focusing about soldiers. If I want to make comparison about the situation uh, in Gaza in 2014, when Israel uh, um, invaded Gaza, they killed around 1,400 civilians. But if we want to see how many uh, Israeli were killed, they around like uh, 50, and the majority, all of them uh, soldiers. This evidence that Palestinian target the uh, the soldiers, but in media they wanted to say this war against Hamas militants, against the rockets, and they exaggerated about the power of rockets. I live in Gaza. I know the situation well. Uh, it's not like the media portrays the situation in Gaza. Nothing. People are uh, struggling in order to achieve the self-determination, uh, to achieve the right of return, according to United Nations resolutions. So, uh, yeah. Maybe yeah, it's Tiana. She wants to. Uh, I just also want to say something about the chemical weapons yeah. fact that I don't think was has been mentioned today, um, and the fact and that's the fact that um, the U.S.-led coalition attacks happened before the, um, the investigation. Yeah, the investigation. So the investigators were um, about to enter Syria, so it happened before that, um, and that's wrong. Not o only on the most obvious level, uh, because it shows that the U.S. disregards the need for evidence when it's. Um, you know, operate uh, doing um, undertaking these operations, but it also has um, larger consequences when we think about what that means for international norms and international law. Um, in the UN Security Council meeting about Syria, this was before. I'm not sure if it was before or after the attacks, but the um, Security uh, Secretary General said something along the lines of that the Cold War is back with a vengeance, um, except the difference is that the mechanisms and the frameworks that were in place before um, to stop, um, to avoid escalation, like um, military escalation, are not no longer in place. Um, so that's also another thing to think about. And that, yeah, the inter so the OPCW? Yeah, um, The fact that America attacked Damascus before um, the investigation happened means that the institutions that we have in place um, as, you know, as, um, if we want like a, um, as the United Nations, the institutions that we have in place pretty much mean nothing. Um, that's like the overall meaning, so, yeah, and it's just, um, it's like the deterioration of international law, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I also, um, uh, I'll, I'll get to you, Louis, but, um, I also remember that uh, uh, the United States actually bombed uh, a facility in Syria, and it's it's the scientific research 
facility that they used last year um, in order to, to assess the claims from, from the evidence from Khan Sheikh Kun. Now, um, the, the interesting thing there is that by destroying that facility and saying that it was being used to, use to, to develop chemical weapons, the United States effectively destroyed one of the few institutions in Syria that had the ability to independently verify on their end the samples that are given to them. So there's other motives there as well. Uh, just, just quickly on that, yeah. the blocking of the uh, of ECW, the people by the Syrian <coughs> It's been alleged that yeah. Russia interfered in blocking. I was sniped at when they were sniped at. Uh, Who exactly? the inspectors were sniped at when they first went in with Syrian soldiers? Uh, the, someone, some hold out, hold out of the people that didn't leave Duma have sniped at them, and so they pulled back. Okay, so it's being represented as Russia has yeah. blocked them. Again, this is. There, there were these claims that the Syrian government was blocking the OPCW from entering, but there's no evidence of that. We're simply, we simply have to believe the State Department to, to take that claim seriously. Um, the, the actual record, as I understand it, is that they were invited in within the, within the space of a few days, but they basically said the security situation is such that we have to first make sure that it's safe. And so that's entirely legitimate because obviously they're, they're trying to rid the area of an insurgency. But then that was counted with, oh, but Robert Fisk got in there. Um, dozens of journalists have been in there. Dozens of journalists have been in there. Since, Plenty of, since, since, since the attacks last week. But yes, but with the OPCW, the difference is that um, there is, if, if, it, if we take the, the, the counter narrative, which is that um, the, the entire event was staged in order to blame the government, then there is an interest in those who staged it to prevent the OPCW from coming to a conclusion that the government wasn't responsible. And so there's, there's obviously an incentive to, to attack them. I mean, that's, uh, that's something that they could definitely fear. I want to say something to that. Yep. Sorry, just add something to that. The OPCW has had a brief for a number of years to determine whether a chemical attack took place without blaming anyone. Um, there was, that began five years ago. Um, there's something else, a subgroup called, which last year was called the Joint Investigative Mechanism, which was going to cast blame. And because it was so politicized, it was wound up late last year. So the Syrians and the Russians um, invited the OBCW in, in the first place, knowing that they're not going to uh, allocate blame, but they are going to determine whether attack took place. To say also about that, um, I think you're referring to the claims that Russia vetoed mm, um, right. the, yeah. you know, the resolution for the, the OPCW yeah, to going. But that's um, most of that is pretty much people going off taking America's word as the truth because the OPCW have said mentioned nothing about um, being blocked or anything. Like that. OPCW yeah. themselves have said yeah. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's mainly people just taking America's word for it and the media blowing it up as well. So. Yeah, it goes back to the to the stuff about the media that Tim was mentioning. I mean, if you hear that the OPCW has been blocked, then the most obvious immediate thing that you should do is go to the Twitter page of OPCW and see if they've made a statement saying we've been blocked. Because if they have, then they'll say it. Louis. Yeah, thanks. Because I thought yeah, it was um, really interesting and informative from each of you. Um, my question is just in relation to whether or not you guys kind of think that there's a bit of a shift within the mainstream media. I mean, with like uh, Tucker Carlson, Patrick Cockburn, and Robert Fisk kind of getting, I don't know whether maybe it's just from my kind of analysis of it, but more recently they've been given, you know, like a kind of broader platform and more people are engaging in their ideas and sharing their stories. And do you think that there's been an increase? I mean, even uh, Shamik uh, in relation to Gaza. Have you seen that like the Western media's narrative over the last few weeks has kind of shifted from, I guess, initially, you know, portraying it as clashes and, you know, violence breaking up. And then now there's more of a, you know, honest reflection on the uh, actions that are taking place. Uh, would you attribute to that anything in particular? Any? Uh, I, there's quite a lot of um, counter stories to the official line now. Uh, I don't think the media itself, the management has changed it much. Um, Tiana made that point that the BBC, the BBC, the UK Guardian and the British Times have all recently run deliberate hit stories on people who are criticising the war narrative. Uh, like, they've gone out of their way. I think the, the Guardian got some technology reporter in San Francisco to attack some of these. The very prominent independent reporters like Vanessa Bealey and uh, Eva Bartlett. Now they're attacking um, uh, Martin Susley in, in Perth and um, Sarah Abdullah in Canada. And uh, I've been hit a couple of times. 
So they're really making an effort at an editorial level there, but some things are slipping through. Less so in the liberal media. I would say The Guardian and the BBC are more monolithic. I have seen one or two articles in the BBC. I remember four years ago, the BBC ran an hour-long radio program saying, are we, are we funding Al-Qaeda in Syria? You know, and then, but then uh, ever, ever after that, anyone who says that is, is a conspiracy theorist. So it's not coincidental, I'd suggest, that the right-wing media, like, who's that young guy called, you mentioned, um, who, uh, America, uh, one, one American uh, media or something. Pearson, Pearson. Pearson Sharp, some young guy who went in there and just immediately started and broadcast on LAN. Talking to dozens of people, and they said no, no, there was no chemical attack here, and they were, he has people laughing there. Actually, big interview with him and Trekker as well. In fact, it's, oh, with Trekker too, a guy at Syrian. So there's, this, um, there's 13, uh, 13 health workers in the Duma hospital. This is it's a rather long video and it's got some terrible music on and everything. But 13 health workers are saying there, was no, there were no people suffering chemical. Uh, chemical injuries that came in here that day. There were people suffering uh, dust, uh, dust and uh, asthma and all sorts of things like that. And then the young boy that Tiana mentioned is in this video here too. The 13 health workers, a lot of them immediately uh, moved in to say, now there's a big story out there, that Assad has intimidated all of them. Assad has intimidated all of them. The Syrian army has intimidated all of them. And so they're all being, all being coached to say their lines. Bear in mind that these people, if you look at them, the people that lived under Jaish al-Islam and Jabhat al-Nusra for the last four, four years in Duma, and Duma is a very conservative area where there is genuine social support for al-Qaeda. There is, it's always, it's for a long time it's been a very conservative area. All of the women health workers are all wearing burqas. You don't really see a burqa in, in Damascus, hardly a, Most women would wear a hijab, but you don't see burqas there. In, all of the health workers, doctors are, are there. They, are probably mostly anti-government, those health workers. But they're Assad apologists now because they said there was, they didn't see any more of the chemical, chemical injury. So all of this stuff is there, but there's a, a, a renewed campaign to say they've all been um, they've all been pressured. Then there's this little boy who kind of was... Do you want to show the, the little boy? Yeah, I'm trying to stay here as well. Yeah. Um, just about that, um, I actually did, like, I was, like, shocked when I saw, like, um, a lot of... Um, the tones of the news stories we have we're seeing have changed a bit, and I thought about it like, um, what what's the difference? What could be the difference? And I think um, it goes back to what um, Tim was saying before. When we look at the difference um, in administrations, so under Obama, obviously it was a much more under the surface kind of um, operation that was going on in Syria. So um, you know most of the fighting was done through proxy, you know. Um, you know, yeah, proxy jihadist militias um, that they trained and funded and sent in. But now um, we're seeing a much more realist approach to Syria. Everything's a bit more open. And I don't think that um, the change in the tone um, is to do with them like, finally opening up to what's, in, um, what's happening in Syria. It's more them taking into account America's interests. So, like... And also yeah. Syria is one, that's why, because yeah. it's an admission of defeat. Yeah. 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 Oh, um, Shamik, yeah. Shamik wanted to respond to what Lewis was saying, right? Uh, yeah, first I will talk about the strong connection between Syria and Palestine. <coughs> and we should not forget that Zionist lobby has a great, a strong influence in media. So all the time, Israel force and push America to bomb Syria. Because the aim of this war against Syria, to destroy Syria as a country, as a culture, as a, not, they are not against like regime or government. The, the Zionist uh, idea all the time thinking to destroy the three armies, Egyptian army, Iraqi army, and Syrian army. Egyptian army now. Uh, after the war in 1973, after the agreement between Egypt and Israel, so no any like uh, no problem with Egyptian army, and after that they destroyed uh, Iraqi army. So now they trying to destroy Syrian army, and honestly succeeded 
to push this army for war against militants around the world. And most of the groups in Syria are not like uh, Syrian groups. From all around the world, they supported by Saudi and Qatar. And Saudi and Qatar didn't deny their rule to support these groups. And uh, I think the foreign minister of Qatar said we supported these groups and we thought that we would succeed. Yeah. And in fact, they failed. Why they failed? They failed because they can't be able to destroy Syria because Syria is not like, uh, like any group supported by USA or something like that. They are in, this country is independent. It's not like other countries who depend on America and uh, Britain. It's not like Saudi, it's not like Qatar. They have independent in economy, independent in political uh, decisions. Uh, about Palestine, uh, two weeks ago, we organized a big rally against the crimes in Gaza, but unfortunately we didn't see any media. Why? The question. We are talking about peace journalism where the media in order to raise the voices of uh, like solidarity movement. Also, I remember when we organized a rally against the visit of Netanyahu and the media coverage were talking that a few hundreds of supporters of uh, religious groups are against Judaism, against anti-Semitics. Uh, they changed the fact. But the truth, there was big rally against criminal. It's name, uh, his uh, name uh, Netanyahu. He commit massacres, crimes against humanity despite of highlighting the crimes that Netanyahu commit, they are like uh, justifying their, these crimes and just wanted to say we are against uh, like Jewish people. That is not true. If you, I can send you some reports about this rally and you will laugh, uh, we will laugh so much about these reports because they are talking about something like silly. It's not like without evidence about what they are claiming. Also about America. When I was a little boy, I remember when they show movies like uh, about Vietnam. And uh, when I was a little boy, I was thinking that American people are good and Rambo is very good and uh, Vietnam, people uh, in Vietnam are like represent the evil. So, this is propaganda. Louis, um, you asked that question about like uh, just the media shifting. I think the, the interesting thing here is that um, uh, after 9-11, the, the dominant racism that got promoted in the West was Islamophobia. And quite honestly, the war in Syria conflicts with that narrative because the United States was exposed for arming and supplying the very Islamist groups that they had been demonizing for the past 10 years. They didn't have that same problem in the 1980s when they were arming and funding Al-Qaeda to fight against the Afghan government and its Soviet backers. And that's because the, the dominant um, ideological prism for viewing everything back then was anti-communism. And so the Islamists in Afghanistan were these religious people and they were fighting against a godless regime like the Soviet Union. So I think... <laughs> Like, what's happened is that there's been this clash, you know, they've gone from being Islamophobic, Islamophobic, oh, okay, 2011, we have to support Islamic extremists, and then it confused a lot of people because the leftists, for 10 years, they were kind of socialized to believe that Islamic extremism is an expression of victimhood, you know, it's like, oh, this poor guy, you know, he, like, he's oppressed by the government, so he went into his... his neighbor's house and killed an Alawite, you know, like that's just what they do when they're victimized. It's a kind of racism, you know, towards Arabs. That this is just how they be behave, right? And leftist, that's a left-wing type of racism, right? Whereas, you know, the right-wing, because they've always bought into the Islamophobic narrative, um, they're like, yeah, these people are Islamists, and so they wind up being on the right side, but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> that's my explanation for why I think, as you mentioned, Tucker Carlson and Fox News, 
they end up finding themselves on the right side. But uh, the reason they're doing so is, um, is, I think, partially pragmatism, but also partially because the previous uh, uh, 10 years of Islamophobia actually confirms a lot of what they're seeing in Syria. Added to that is, oh, conversely, is you've got these extreme left people, um, Louis Proyset, Pro Pro yeah. Pro yeah. you know, arguing vehemently against this alternative narrative, and likewise someone else I'm familiar with, uh, uh, from the volunteer in Greece, the refugee crisis, an uh, English fellow, massive big piece in the in, in media, um, stating why I will attack anyone who shares RT with graphs and graphica and um, you know, tracking devices about this conspiracy by the Russians to drive all this alternative narrative. Yeah. Yeah, and as for all the demonization of IT, it just goes back to what Tim says. I mean, read absolutely everything, check the sources, look for the quotes, and look for the evidence fundamentally. Just critique everything. Question back. Thanks for that. Just a question about, um, I guess, forming opinions on certain amount of issues. Just, I guess, touching on what Tim said, you mentioned a lot of things to consider in terms of um, observing reports of a social drama. You can consider the interests of the sources, the other side of the story. Um, check for independent evidence. As a student, I tend to struggle with when you're presented with so much information and there's so many, I guess, differing views and so many different things to consider and also when you're, I guess, limited by word limits and different things. Is there any one of those elements that are most important when making a decision or is it kind of just you know, in a scenario where you can't really sit in the fence? Is it just individual discretion or the way you interpret it? I think uh, I tried to make them principles that were based on traditional research principles and then, as I said, bolstered by, in these extreme situations, because we're talking about international conflict where we can't measure those sorts of things. Things happening in our own country, we've got, we have, can have some measure, we can get some more information about it, but um, it, it's more important in, in international conflict to look for both sides but, and independent evidence. They're not that complicated. It does require a little bit of time and of course this was the problem with the Libyan conflict I think that no one had much time to read about it. The extraordinary thing with the Syrian conflict is people have had a lot of time to work it out. Why haven't people, educated people, read more in seven and a half years of war uh, and found out more, at least looked at the other side, at least looked for some independent evidence. They're not radical principles at all. I just introduced that thing about reading the other sides, uh, you know, the making a difference between the self-serving statements and the admissions against the interest because it's a criminal principle, a forensic principle, and um, you know people sometimes misunderstand that. They think, well, I can't read that source, I can't read that source. You, you look at RT, but you look at RT knowing that it's a Russian perspective, fine, it's a Russian perspective, like the BBC is a British perspective, basically. But then within that, you just find you know the accounts from witnesses. That's one of the good things that journalists do. They do present, uh, I mean, journalism has a lot of rubbish in it, but it also has inter direct interviews with people, and you're, we're able to see them ourselves as though we were a jury in a courtroom, you know, so this thing which you know, may show, maybe, maybe show it now, is this little boy who just adds something to what the hell was saying. He was one of the people... Have you heard footage? Yeah. It was seen around the world at the start of the month, claiming to show the aftermath of an alleged chemical attack in Syria. It is now being called into question. A team, of, uh, a team from our sister channel, RT Arabic, visited the town of Duma. Earlier, Rory Suchet discussed what they saw with Yubo Jadaf. What we've seen so far from this place wasn't much. Mostly it's been a video released by the White Helmets activist group. You're looking at it right now. It's shot in a hospital and it shows some truly heartbreaking pictures. The scenes of chaos, of panic, confused children being hosed down with water, everything pointing at a potential chemical attack. But our RT Arabic crew managed to talk to a boy who was featured in this video of the White Helmets and uh, he gave his account of uh, events in that hospital. Have a listen. We were outside and they told all of us to go into the hospital. 
I was immediately taken upstairs and they started pouring water on me. Do you remember where it happened? Here with the hose. Where is it? Here it is. They poured water on me. They put me here and then took me upstairs to my mother. Where exactly upstairs? The second floor. Upstairs, over there. The doctor started filming us here. They were pouring water and taking videos. And then my father came and found me. Someone had told him we were here, so he came and took me away. I went upstairs and saw my wife and children there. I was very surprised and asked what had happened, while my son's eyes were red. I found out that it was water, but it was cold. He could have got sick. He was undressed. When I took my son, they at first told me that they still needed him, but I still took him away from there. The boy is clearly in shock still. To have to go through something like this, uh, or to go through such terror at his age, is unthinkable, really. We've reached out to the White Helmets, requesting a statement of some reaction to uh, what's, being, what's being filmed in Duma right now, but we're still to hear back from them. Igor, as I understand, there was other footage from the... Okay, there's, there's other stuff as well. I sat intimidated all of them, that's why... Can I ask your opinion in regards to um, AB, ABC, sort of the Australian ABC, that it is considered a, you know, a re respectable organisation, yet you have uh, Sophie McNeil reporting from the Middle East and also Matt Brown reporting from the Middle East. Um, and and they, they have used, you know, ABC reporting on Palestine in particular and also nowadays uh, Syria. Could you provide some info? Have you I know that I know that what I've noticed about the ABC's reporting a lot is that they rely on, for example, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. Now, this organization has been has been debunked as a fraud for quite a long time. I remember just recently I had a look at their, their aggregate casualty figures for all of the, the, the different categories of casualties throughout the throughout the conflict. And the the one particular category that was missing was the category for Syrian Arab army soldiers. And so when you added all of them up, like all of the different figures, it added up to a certain um, number. And then for some reason, like if you, if you, um, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to explain it again. Okay, the, <clears throat> the Syrian Arab army figure wasn't there. Instead, what was there is the number of people who have been killed by the Syrian Arab army which is strange, because you've got one saying this many so-called rebels, this many Hezbollah, this many Iranian, this many Russian, this many people have been killed by the Syrian Arab army, right? But then the, if you did the, the calculations, right, it turned out that the, um, the Syrian Arab army's like, um, number right, actually is exactly the same uh, amount as the, the, the amount that's missing between all of the other casualties. I'm not explaining it well, but it was something that, like, you know, can easily kind of skip your attention unless you actually get a calculator out and do all the, do all the things like that. But then what happens is when you try and expose this kind of stuff, people call you a conspiracy theorist, and they continue using exactly the same sources. So that's how I criticize the ABC. Okay. Um, I'll just add to that, maybe not everyone knows, but... The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights is a one-man show in Coventry in England by an exiled Syrian. And he, for a long time, but not in the last year, he flies the, the Red Star flag of the, of the Free Army, of the Islamist groups, basically. He took that down recently, but the fact that he was flying that flag, and everyone knows that he's really effectively linked into what they euphemistically call the opposition, that he meant the opposition armed groups. Um, they've been using as a main source until this day, and even RT uses him to some degree, a source who is linked to the jihadist groups as their primary information source, without a thought that this is some sort of conflict of interest, without saying, uh, sometimes they say he's linked to the opposition, but uh, he's linked to the opposition afterwards. Um, but that one person has, has provided a huge amount of uh, stories in Western media. Yeah, I was thinking also about Palestine because on occasion, you know, on Palestine they say that they are kind of even, when we have even complained that they have given, you know, maybe um, 10 seconds or 15 seconds to um, pro um, 
Palestinians or people to talk on Palestine. Then they give, you know, a minute or more mm. to other, to, to those, you know, of Israel. And they keep on, you know, anything to do with the government of Israel and they, they provide more, um, yes, uh, a state or a, a platform for, for all those, in a way, justifying the, the attacks on just um, one thing, uh, just because like the, the audience is dwindling, I was wondering if Tiana could just um, mention this, it's quite important. And then we'll get to you directly. Okay, yeah. okay so um, this is a petition I'm holding uh, in my hand on behalf um, uh, of hands, hands of Syria. Hands of Syria. Um, and it basically it's calling the Australian government to end the sanctions, the economic sanctions on Syria. So um, to break it down, despite um, or whatever... Um, you know, side of the conflict you're on, or you know, despite any of the political nuances, the economic sanctions affect every single Syrian. Um, what they do is they lift the prices of food and medicine. Um, they make it harder harder for family here and refugees here to send aid um, back home. So it'd be really appreciated if before um, you left, if you just wanted to, you know, make your voice heard in a small way um, to sign this petition, because um, it could really make a difference. So thank you. I'll pass it around and give it to Sean. I will uh, give you an example about my experience. Two years ago, I wrote an initiative in order to activate the nonviolent resistance in Gaza and West Bank. And um, I am trying to convince the Palestinians youth unions in order to adopt like this initiative. And um, after they translated this initiative, there were some seminars and discussions about how we can apply the theories and uh, the plan in Gaza about activating nonviolent resistance because uh, in Gaza it's not easy to go to the borders because I remember when I was in Gaza and we go to the borders, there is no like uh, transportations, no water, no amp ambulances, so so hard. So my initiative about to building like uh, place or square to support the protesters when they go to the rally because uh, I remember when uh, my friend was uh, killed at this uh, protest before I come to Australia because he was injured and we didn't find ambulance to to help him. Then the idea start. I started to think how to build a strong like movement. And after long um, discussion, the old Palestinian factions and uh, organization and civil uh, organization accepted this plan and started to build like uh, like uh, uh, tents and uh, square of nonviolent resistance in Gaza. I, I was shocked when I saw media in Australia say, look, Hamas started to uh, push people to the borders to kill the civilians. But that is not the truth. It's not Hamas. The situation is completely different. Why I was shocked? Because I know all the details about that. Everything about what happened in Gaza and why they wanted to start uh, nonviolent resistance is not, it wasn't easy, so hard. And this is not Hamas. This is all the Palestinian factions, organizations, youth students, and uh, unions, and uh, activists, and journalists, all of them, they are in agreement to activate nonviolent resistance, taking into consideration to refute the allegations of Israel also to give the journalists the chance to uncover the truth. And I think they succeeded. Because no one can believe what happened in Gaza, like uh, any like armed resistance, or uh, Palestinians can uh, target Israeli civilians. Because uh, they just, this peaceful rallies. 
So here, still in Australia, trying to explain the situation in Gaza as a war between Israel and Hamas. And that is not true. And Hamas is part of many factions in Gaza, not represent all Palestinians. So now I think the strategy of Palestinians to activate nonviolent resistance, taking into account to refute the allegations, and look what happened. Uh, Israel was criticized in international uh, forums, in United Nations, and uh, now criminal uh, court are talking, it is important to investigate about the crimes against uh, civilians in Gaza. And um, honestly, I am uh, optimistic about uh, this strategy. I think we can achieve or to be close to achieve our goals in this struggle. Thank you. Okay, unless there's uh, any more questions, I think we're gonna wind up. Uh, any final questions from the floor? Oh, okay, cool. We'll make this the, the last one then. More of a comment, really. Um, personally, I don't need any proof even though it's great that there are networks trying to provide proof that something is wrong in the Middle East, in Syria, I act on gut instinct. And my gut instinct right away when I saw that chemical attack was that no way that it was done by the government of Syria. And personally, I feel that that boy is no different to me. My, my background is Iranian, I'm Shia, extremely ostracized in this country and when I see things like that it does stir me, it stirs my emotions and I think more people should get in touch with those emotions because that's real um, I feel that what we need to do is talk to each other more on a human level and if we're searching for the truth which is first search inside. And yeah, I'm not the same. Thank you for those comments. Um, thanks everyone for turning up today. Uh, it was a good discussion. It was good to have those uh, speakers uh, go over the various controversies. So we're going to wind up now. Um, yeah, so if you've uh, signed the petition, um, we, just speaking as a member of Hands Off Syria, um, we intend to make the san sanctions issue a real issue, something that we should be campaigning over. And the reason why I think it's important is because even if you speak to people who hate President Assad and, and call him Satan and all that kind of stuff, how can they ultimately justify imposing sanctions on a country? Again, on the same pretext that sanctions were imposed on Iraq. Sanctions were imposed on Iraq on the grounds that Iraq used chemical weapons, which they actually did. But the left, uh, when they look back at that period, they lament the fact that those sanctions happened and they criticize it for having killed half a million Iraqi children. The sanctions against Syria are no less comprehensive. We have to oppose it. And eventually, when we do have enough names on that petition, we will be taking it to politicians so that the Syrian community can say, you're hurting our families back home. Thank you very much.